Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the general discussion series. And it is a question and answer session from people in Philadelphia. Presented by Jesus on the 19th of October 2013 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. This is session one, part one. And line back on. Good day. Well, welcome. Many of you would have travelled for some distance, yes? Okay, so uh, um, ho hopefully the next day or two will be worth your while of travelling. Um, Mary and I have spent about uh, 32 hours total travelling, I think, <laughs> to get here from our home. And uh, because our home is out in the bush in Australia, we have to drive three hours into the city first. And then what we do is we stay overnight in the city because usually the flights that we get are the starting the next morning quite early. And so that's been our... We started travelling Monday to get here. And uh, because of the way the time zones all work, we actually arrived here Tuesday night at 9.30, but that was 32 hours of travelling. So... Um, and since then, myself and Mary haven't had much luck getting our body clocks <laughs> onto US time, unfortunately. So I'm quite tired and, and Mary's quite tired as well. We uh, have been waking up for some unknown reason at about 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning and not able to go back to sleep again until around 7 in the morning. So, um, so this morning that meant I got, uh, I got to sleep at quarter to six this morning, so that means I got two and a quarter hours uh, so hopefully we'll be right today and stay, keep the energy up for that time that we need to. But we've been travelling a lot, um, and, uh, which we're not all, uh, always keen on doing. But uh, we, we, before we came here to the US, we went to the UK last, the month before. And uh, we've also had visitors from the UK who are from the media, like doing BBC documentaries and things like that. So there's been quite a lot on that we've had over the last few months in particular. So we've been quite busy. And this will be quite a busy trip as well. We're hoping to not only do the seminars uh, like today and tomorrow, but also we're hoping to do a whole heap of questions uh, that we've pre-prepared with people um, during the times that we're not doing the seminar. So, so in the end, there'll be quite a lot of video that will be coming from all of the material that we'll produce while we're here in the States. And we'll be here till, I think it's November the 27th or 28th. Cornelius has come with us this time. Corny's our, <laughs> Corny's our next door neighbour as well. So that was easy, you know, we just jumped in the same car and came. And, uh, and he'll be here, uh, you're coming back with us, aren't you now? So, so the same period of time. So if you want to get to know Corny, then I'm sure he'll be open to allowing that to occur. Maybe. <laughs> if he doesn't want to hide too much, that's the, <laughs> that's the issue. Um, we'll also be having that, uh, many of you would probably already be aware that we're having that thing down in Texas. Um, we're calling it that thing because we don't really know what else to call it. <laughs> um, it's the first time we've probably spent a bit of time with a group of people for a, for a period of time that's longer than a few days and so uh, in, a, in an informal setting. Um, the rest, of, I have stayed with people many times before, met some of you I've stayed with before, um, but that's very different to what we're organising in Texas, it's sort of everybody getting together, whoever wanted to come. So some of you I know will be down there with us, so um, I hope you enjoy that down there, but it will be quite confronting probably for many people who come. So just be prepared to be confronted, particularly with the addictions that you have. The, the whole idea today and tomorrow is basically that I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. So many of you would have already seen some things on YouTube or, or, uh, or some other way on our website and read some things and so forth and you might have questions. And I'm at your disposal for two days, basically, to answer any questions that you have. We, we're doing this more frequently lately because what we've decided to do, myself, Mary and myself, 
is to present new information in the format of Mary and myself having a discussion. And the reason why we've been doing that is because we feel that it's actually more... We get to present all the information we would like to present. The problem with presenting new information in a seminar is that quite often the audience takes us off on a track asking questions that, uh, that, we, that means that we don't get to actually cover all the material of that particular subject. And, and if we don't cover the material of a certain subject, it's hard to go back to it at a later point. You've got to create another seminar, and then when you start covering that particular material, usually that group of people want to go off on another tangent. And so what we've, we've ended up doing is actually having discussions between myself and Mary that are quite um, focused on a piece of subject or subject material, and then using these uh, seminars as a, as a way for you to engage any of that subject material in a more question and answer format so that you can have your personal answers uh, given to you about those particular things. I don't know if many of you are aware, but we've started a, a, a channel on YouTube called the Frequently Asked Questions channel. And we've been adding, I think at the moment we're up to around 300 questions or so. A lot of that material is actually material we've not covered anywhere else. So uh, it's worth having a look at that material. Some of it's based on religion. Some of it's based on spiritual matters, questions that myself and Mary have been asked about our own identities, about um, divine truth itself, about parenting and you know, bringing up children. Um, other subjects include spirits and you know, who, what spirits are. And, and what we're trying to do with the FAQs is to try to make them stand alone so that, so that you can watch one video and get an answer to one specific question. And, and that means we're trying to make them as complete as we possibly can, which is very, very different to the other material that we present. So if you aren't aware of that channel, my suggestion is to have a look at that channel uh, with regard to the questions that we're placing. We're hoping to get around a couple of thousand questions on there eventually, and we're hoping that it will be like a resource for people who want to not watch hours and hours of videos, but rather just want to get an answer to a specific question or a specific problem that they have and be able to you know, go through the answer in video format and in audio format. And, and this will give people the option of being able to share the material with other people as well, quite simply, rather than having to wade through hours and hours of a video to find the answer to a specific question that they've had. So we've also got now people working on cutting up the videos um, that have been question and answer videos like we'll be doing today and tomorrow and cutting them up into one question with an answer. So we've also got some people started to do that. It's quite a time-consuming thing, as you can imagine, so it takes some time to get all that sorted. There's also a group of people, and some of you are involved, I know, in translating some of the material. So there's a whole transcription group of people now who volunteer their time transcribing every seminar or every production of new material. And then there's a group of people who translate that into other languages. And at the moment, there's 13 different languages that are being translated in different material is being translated in. And you can imagine that does take a long time. Uh, and it's all volunteer effort that's, that's creating all of these things. So, so that's what we've been doing. Uh, there's quite a lot going on. We have also have a friend who started to uh, produce books. Um, he was given a great big photocopier um, by somebody who just volunteered this copier. It's a monster copier. And uh, it, that means that we can actually produce books, uh, colour books, um, up to 48 pages or so thick, self-bound, and send them anywhere in the world as well. So that's all started to happen. And there's, at the moment, I think a library of about 12 books that, that we've begun with, but um, that will also increase over time. So there's quite a lot of things going on with different people in Australia, of which we got no control over, and we don't control any of it. We just facilitate it through giving people the material and they work on their own desires to do a lot of these things. So we would like to take the opportunity to thank all of those people for all of that work that they're doing 
many, much of which you would never have heard about divine truth yourselves if they hadn't have done some of that work. So, so we, we're very thankful that they have done that kind of work. Um, aside from that, I don't think there's too much more that Mary and I need to do as an introduction. Oh yes, lots of people in Australia knew we were coming and uh, so they send their love to you. They, they would like you to receive that if that's okay with you. Um, of course, it's your free will choice to receive that. <laughs> no worries. Many of them you've seen on videos, right? So, so many of them you probably even think you know fairly well. Um, and they, they have... Uh, we, we, we haven't been doing many um, presentations in Australia, actually. We've only done three this entire year uh, of presentations in front of audiences. And so uh, the last presentation we did was in, down in New South Wales. And again, it was a question and answer series like we're doing now with you. So I'm at your disposal for the next eight hours. <laughs> for today and for tomorrow. With a plus or minus of a few hours, perhaps. <laughs> so who would like to start with some questions? Marina, thanks. Thank you. Um, should I stand up or is it okay? No, you can okay, just sit cool. down and I can uh, see I wanted you. to say thank you so much for coming back again. My Sometimes pleasure. every time I see you guys, I always think like, oh, it's the last time I'm going to see them, but it never is, which is good. No, it so, is and never going to be a last time you see us, That's probably. true. <laughs> <laughs> and really nice to meet Cornelius too, so that's also really yeah. awesome, so yeah. cool. Um, I have a question about aliens. Being that God created everything and we're supposed to be his greatest creation, yep. I was always under the impression, and I feel, that aliens are indeed superior to us, smarter. I, I do feel that there is something out there in that way. And I'd like to know um, your take of the truth about that. <laughs> it's, it's really important for me, for my faith in God, because like, I know why, that Why is that, Miranda? Bigger. Why is it so important? Um, if I feel that we are created in his image, yep. I feel that I have a lot of lack, I guess, somewhere. Yeah. And aliens, I feel like, like because I feel like they're better or, or whatever. But that's it is. just an imaginary thing. You've never met one, have you? No. No. I haven't. So you, but I watch a lot of movies. So that you're hoping that they're better than you are. Is that what is going on? Um, I think that are, there are a lot of things that are better than me. But um. Yeah. Which is the emotion, isn't it, that's driving it? That, that emotion of feeling insecure or insignificant yourself. Do they exist? Like, do they? Do other people exist no, on other aliens. planets? Yeah, sure. Yes. Now, I can explain that to you, but yeah. can I just, before I explain that to you, give you some things to reflect about in terms of the most important questions that you could ask? Okay. Can we do that? There's, I feel there's five subject matters that are the most important subject matters that you could ask questions about at any time. What do you think those five subjects might be? Out of interest. You want to start, Katerina? Well, if we wait for the mic. Yep. Uh, I would think the most important one would be God. Well, I don't know about that because it, like I do believe God is the most important being in the universe. However, most people, when they begin asking questions spiritually, they've got no idea who God is, no idea of God's character, no idea of God's attributes, no idea of um, God's personality. And so for the majority of people, usually questions about God come down the track a bit because of those reasons, uh, which is unfortunate in some ways because God being our creator, we, we could find out a lot of things about God. And my primary focus is about God. But I feel there's certain things about God that actually we need to ask questions about. Right. That's what I was feeling too, like all this time, that I keep thinking and feeling God is far away from me. Yes. But since I, I am understanding from a child that there is a God. Yes. And he is there, then I have all these questions about the relationship with us, about the relationship with me. Uh, and I have understood throughout the years growing up in a Greek Orthodox religion yep. that the misinformation was vast. Yeah, so I feel that 
before we ask questions about God, we've really got to have some kind of faith in God before we can actually ask questions about God. So to me, one of the first things that we need to ask questions about is faith. Does that make sense? Yes. How do I gain faith in God? How do I gain faith that I've, I've got a soul? How do I gain faith that, that, I, that, that God wants a relationship with me? How do, I, how do I do all of that? I feel this issue is faith is a huge issue that many of us avoid. And a lot of our questions are asked because we don't have faith yet. Okay. Can you see that? So, so Marina's question, for example, is based around, upon a feeling that she has that she doesn't have any faith that there is goodness in herself. Does that make sense? So, so did God create you good or not? Did, do you have faith in that? There's a question, there's the question there of what, where is your faith? So I feel faith is one very, very important thing. Now, in amongst that faith, it's faith in God's character and attributes and personality, faith that you have the ability to progress, that you have the ability to change, that you have the ability to grow, that you have the ability to have more actual control over your life by growing your soul. What is the soul? Faith in the soul. All of the, Faith is like a key part of any future growth. So I feel it's one of the most important things we could ask questions about. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, but I, I do also feel that with faith... The minute you take a step towards an action, mm -hmm. you can get confirmation right away whether that was good or bad. Exactly. And then that builds up the faith. But what causes you to make even the step, to take the step? Well, for me, uh, not being satisfied with where I am, so the, feeling pain. Okay, so some of the pain and suffering sometimes causes you to take a step. Right, I agree. because there's got to be something better or something more. But that feeling, there's got to be something better is the beginning of faith. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then you just kind of go, and if you get a good confirmation, then you take another step. And yes. And you take another step and... Yes. So, but there's many people on this planet who have no feeling at all that there is something better. In fact, okay. the, there's most people on the planet feel a, f a strong feeling of disillusionment, that there is nothing better. And that's why, in fact, they live the life they currently live, because they don't believe there is anything better. They don't even believe on earth that there is any way to make their life better. Right. They feel that they are controlled often by external circumstances. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is all questions relating to faith, I feel. So that, that's one primary subject that I feel is a really important subject to ask questions about. Is there anything else that you might think of that's important to ask questions about? Do you want to, Kristen? Truth. Truth, yes. I would put something before that, though. Um, so let's put that uh, down in this list a bit. Um, one, two, one, two. I'll put that down here. So this one is the four. <laughs> Any ideas? If Mike, can we come for some Mike? Fear is important to talk about. Uh, fear, yes, but, but really, if we look at it from a positive perspective... Fear and truth are very much related to each other. And fear and faith are very much related to each other as well. So in amongst, uh, in amongst there, I feel fear has a negative effect on many of these things. But I don't think I'd like to focus on asking questions about fear so much, if it was me, because I'm more focused on getting rid of my fear rather than holding on to my fear. But certainly fear has a very, very large effect on whether you do any of these things. So it's certainly important. But, but I feel fear is involved in all of these things in some, in some way. Or, or a lack of fear is involved in all of these things, the opposite of fear. Yep. If we go back. Uh, who has that hand? Oh, let's come over here. Yep. Hi there. Welcome. It's so great to see you. And Mary. What was your name? I'm Dan. Nice from to meet you, York. Dan. Um, hi. Um, so just let me get clear. The five, these are five th questions or five things we want to ask about. Five subjects. Subjects. That would actually, I'm going to get back to answering Marina's question mm -hmm. at some point, by the way. But, but what I'm trying to do with you is to get you to think about 
what are the very most important subjects that you could ask questions about that affect your entire future existence? Okay, so one of them, from my own experience and based on my um, listening to you over time, is uh, what am I feeling? Could be one. Where am I at right now? What am I feeling? Okay, yes, yeah, so I would call that um, looking at things with humility. A person who has no humility doesn't want to examine their own feelings. And a person who has humility does want to see what they feel and understand what they feel. If we define humility, we could say that it's the desire, so it involves desire, to feel and experience every single emotion that you have inside of yourself. And the desire to see yourself as God sees you. So when, I, when Marina asked the question right at the beginning about aliens, it was driven by a desire within Marina to not see herself as God sees her. So she sees herself as a limited being and she wants there to be... Uh, well, you know, the question about aliens is often focused on I want there to be some more powerful being that I can aspire to be. But at the end, a lot of times, we don't believe we're ever going to become that kind of person ourselves. And, and that's all about, again, desire to see ourselves as God sees us. If we see ourselves as God sees us, we would, we would see that God designed us as the pinnacle of God's creation. So you know how you said, Marina, that you didn't believe that, really, that you don't believe that about yourself. You might believe that about others, but not about yourself. And I feel that's all a part of humility, this desire to feel, the desire to experience everything, the desire to see yourself as God sees you, the desire to experience your emotions rather than just acknowledge them, but actually to feel them, to, to experience them. And that's all a part of this aspect of humility um, that I feel is very, very important. So any question about humility is going to be a very important question to ask. And in fact, humility is, a, if you think about it, if God knows everything, and let's say at the beginning we, ne we know next to nothing, right? how do you get to knowing next to nothing to knowing almost everything? Can you see there's got to be some kind of feeling in you of wanting to know those things, wanting to understand and know those things? And to do that, we have to learn how to feel but we also have to have some kind of desire to see ourselves as we are right now in comparison to what we could be. We need to understand that as well. And to me, that's a lot about humility as well. Having humility is something that you're going to need for the rest of your existence. God knows everything. We know next to nothing. The only way we're going to get to know the things God knows is by having more humility. So to me, it's a, such an important quality to develop and really important to ask questions about. <laughs> How do I have humility? What, what is it at about? What does it feel like? All of those kind of questions are really important. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, there's a couple missing, three, three missing there, if we come across here. What was your name? Um, my name is Jane. Jane, nice to meet um, you, Jane. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for traveling all the way over it's here. A, it's our pleasure. Yeah. Uh, love. Maybe not always pleasure, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're happy to be here. Thank you. Um, love. Yes. God's love for us, our love for God. Yes, and could we mention one more type of love other than those two? So you mentioned God's love for us. Right. Natural love, love for each other. Yes. So, so God's love for me, my love for God and my love for others. And one more. Self-love. Ah, yes. And my love for myself, which would include the other half of myself. Yep. So those forms of love, obviously, all good things to ask questions about. In fact, uh, if you think about happiness, love and happiness are intrinsically linked together, aren't they? And without love being present in your life, there is 
literally going to be very little happiness in your life. So, so if you're focused on having a happier life, a less painful existence, a happier life, focusing on the development of love is essential for you to enjoy your life more, more fulfillingly. And so these particular questions are very, very important questions, I feel, that we need to ask ourselves about. Okay, so we've still got one missing. What do you think it might be? If we come down to Michael. Our will. Our will. That's our desire to develop how we use our will. How we use our will. Now, we can use our will to love. Or we can use our will to hate. We can use our will to engage in loving acts with others. Or we can use our will to be violent towards others. We can use our will in all of these different ways, both positively and negatively. And so it's very, very important that we understand the effect of using our will. Does that make sense? Now, if we don't use our will appropriately, obviously we will never use our will to develop some of these other characteristics and traits. So can you see that faith and will, I've put them as one and two for a reason, and you could flip them almost as will being number one and faith being number two, they, they are actually required right at the beginning of any development in any direction. So if you wanted to become a scientist, for example, you would have to use your will in a direction to obtain information and knowledge about that particular field of endeavour and you would have to have some faith in yourself that by using your will to get that knowledge you will eventually become the thing you wanted to be, which is a scientist. You would have to have those two qualities no matter what you do, how you develop your life. So if you want to become a builder, you would have to use your will to find out about all the rules and regulations involved in building and, what, how, and also the practical aspects of building. And you would have to have some faith that you can actually do it, that you actually have the power to achieve and, and come to know these things that might be initially difficult for you to know and understand. So faith and will are what you would classify as the motivators, if you like, towards anything. And then these particular things open up the rest of the universe to you. But without these two things, you will not develop in a specific direction. So if you have no faith, for example, that you could become a builder, it doesn't matter how much will you have, it's very, it's very, in fact, it's very highly likely that you'll have very little will without having the faith. Because the two are intrinsically part of each other. For example, if you have no faith you could ever become a builder, why would you ever use your will to become a builder? If you had no faith that you could ever learn the piano, why would you ever use your will to learn the piano? Can you see the two are fairly tightly related to each other. So I feel that these particular two things are very important to ask questions about as well. And important to ask questions in terms of this being the ultimate goal. So this is, this is the happiness area. And my, my, that one's not working. That's a new one, actually. Okay. So that's the area that's going to create the most happiness in your life because they're feelings of love. These other things will contribute to the amount of happiness you eventually experience. So without using your will to love, you will probably never want to find out more about love. Without using your will to live in harmony with love, even when the world around you lives in a different way, that's going to require some strength of character, some courage and other, other qualities. So can you see how these two qualities are going to be tied up in developing these things, which are a part of your relationship with God, your relationship with yourself and your relationship with each other? <coughs> now, when it comes to asking questions, the most important question you 
you could ask in the universe are related to those five things. Because they determine your future life in almost every way, in almost every aspect. And almost every question you could ask eventually gets back to one of these five things at some point. You can break it down and take it back to one of these five things. So let's do that with Marina's question. All right? So Marina's question was, are there alien life forms or life forms on other planets, shall we say, that are of higher development than ourselves? Right. Now, if I had some faith in God, what would I believe about the universe? Because it's a pretty big universe, isn't it? So if I had some faith in God, yes? Um, that it's abundant? That it's abundant with life. And we see that on Earth, don't we? We see life everywhere on Earth. And if man hasn't poisoned it, we see more of it, of course. But we see a huge amount of abundant life on Earth. And therefore, we could assume that uh, we see stars in the sky and we know those stars are suns and there's billions of them. And in fact, there's far more than billions of them. Uh, we could then assume that there must be obviously other planets surrounding these particular suns and therefore potentially an abundance of life of all types of forms in all of these in this universe that we live in. And if we had any uh, examination, faith, faith causes us to examine where we are. So we examine our world and we go, yes, there's lots of life on our world and there's lots of types of intelligent life right the way from humans and some would argue that we're not as intelligent as other things, but from humans down to the, the smallest of life that we can be experienced on Earth, there, are, there is intelligence in the whole lot of it. So then we can assume that there must be intelligence somewhere else as well, other than just on our Earth. It would make sense, would it not? So faith would also dictate in this question that we're now starting to go, OK, the chances of there being life forms on other planets are fairly high. It's got to be fairly high given the fact that if we look at our Earth, we can see the abundance of life forms and we can see that we are just one planet in, in one solar system surrounding one sun and that there's billions and trillions of those particular things going all, all around the universe. We can then basically assume that there must be forms of life on other planets. Now, that doesn't mean that it's human, humans. It could be just there could be microbes or there could be a range of different life on different planets. And, and when I get to answer the question properly from my own experience, I'll tell you what is there. But what I'm trying to help you do here is to reason your way through the answer using the five basic things. Right? And if you, if you have any faith at all, by look, and the way you gain faith is by looking at what you have in front of you and then basing probability upon what you have in front of you, then you could see that faith would determine that there's probably life forms on other planets, wouldn't it? It's pretty unlikely that it is not, in fact. And so before you even discover that there is through your own experience... You could basically assume there is just from looking at what you see on earth and having some faith that God has created abundantly. You could you assume basically that there must be some kind of life on other planets. Can you see that? And so the presumption that there's not is actually a lack of faith in God's abundance. So those people who feel that there isn't life on other planets basically have a lack of faith in God's abundance. Because if, if we assume God is an abundant God and therefore and God creates this large variety of life, we can also then assume that uh, with a high degree of probability that there must be life elsewhere. Okay. Now, how do I find out whether there is? See, most people go, okay, what do I do now to try and discover life on these other planets? Well, what has man done? You think about what man has done already. What have we done? 
to discover whether there's life on other locations in the universe. We've created spaceships, we've created probes, and we've sent them out into the universe with cameras and other detection equipment that eventually some of them have actually landed on other planets in our solar system and they've sampled different parts of the solar system attempting to find this life. Now, why has man done that? Because the average scientist has faith that there must be. He wouldn't spend billions of dollars and all of his life sending out a probe to another planet if he didn't believe in his own heart that there's got to be life there somewhere, would he? Right? So it's very interesting that even the average scientist, if you like, has faith that the universe is abundant. Yeah? So faith is a, a very important quality to develop if we're ever going to discover anything new about the world we live in and ourselves. So, we've sent out all these probes. What's the answer been so far? Does anyone know? We don't know. We don't know. The answer is no, there's not yet been the discovery of life. But, but if you think about it, let's look at the universe itself. Um, and I, it's hard to draw a, a diagram of a universe on a whiteboard, but um, let's just look at it from our perspective. Where There's our solar system. And in amongst the rest of the universe, that doesn't rate any mention whatsoever, does it? It's like a pinprick in the universe in which we live. And the closest star, does anyone know how far that is? The closest sun to us? Right. So if we had to draw it in terms of the expanse of the universe, it's not to scale here, but let's say it's that far away. It's around eight light years. What does that mean? It means that travelling at the speed of light, it would take you eight years to get there. And in fact, it means the light from that sun takes eight years for us to see it. All right. Now, what's the speed of light? Can any of you... So 186,000 miles per second. That's pretty quick. And travelling at that speed... It would take you eight years to get to that closest star. Now, remember, there's trillions and trillions and trillions of these stars. In fact, they actually believe there's billions of galaxies, let alone stars. Right? So, if, so if we look at the fact that there's billions of galaxies, most galaxies are separated by distances anywhere up to hundreds and hundreds and sometimes tens of thousands of light years just one galaxy to the other galaxy. So this is huge universe in which we live, right? But travelling at that speed, it takes us eight years to get to our nearest star. And as yet, there's not been any Earth-based ship or, or anything that has been able to travel at that speed. Because what's our travel of speed in space? Do you know at the moment what it is? Do you know how fast the shuttle... Travels? No? Okay. I think it's around anywhere it ranges, but anywhere from 18,000 miles per hour. Right? Now, that's miles per second. And travelling at that speed would take eight years. Imagine travelling at this speed, miles per hour, how many years it's going to take for any probe we send to get to the nearest star. So, and the problem is, when we get there, it might not be there anymore. Because the light took eight years to get to us, and that light is still travelling, and it could still travel even while the source of the light has now disappeared or being converted into some other kind of matter. So we could travel all that distance and still not find it because it might not be there after all that time that we spent. So can you see, if we are going to find out about the universe in terms of an experiential way while we're living on Earth, we are going to have to develop methods of transportation 
that are faster than light. That's our only option. All right. Now, there are scientists working on that, working on trying to find methods of travel that will be faster than light travel. Now, there are scientists who don't even believe it's possible to travel faster than light. Because what they've found is the faster you propel an atom through space, the closer it gets to light speed, the closer it gets to that speed, 186,000 miles per second, the heavier it gets. And it gets so heavy that eventually they can, they can actually shoot particles through a, a, a gravitational accelerator at close to those speeds. But the particles are so dense and heavy that they penetrate more than eight feet thick of lead before they slow down. That's how heavy and how much force they have. And in fact, you have here in the States, and there's also one in Europe, uh, large gravitational uh, magnetic accelerators just doing particle physics examinations to try to find out how to get beyond the speed of light. And your government and the European government spend huge amounts of money trying to do this every year. You can see why, because they have some faith that there is life out there, but they know that the only way they're going to find it is by being able to travel faster than light. Because if you travel with slow light, the average person's lifetime isn't long enough to discover anything. So they know that it's going to have to happen a lot faster. Now, when you die, of course you don't really ever die, but when you die, you're now in your spirit body. In your spirit body, you're not constrained by the same types of examinations of life. Right? So in your spirit body, you are able to travel faster than light. And in fact, every celestial spirit, a person who's developed in love to the point of becoming at one with God, travels faster than light. Okay. That means that they can examine the universe with a lot more clarity and, and a lot more speed than we can here on earth. So in your future existence, after you've passed and you've become at one with God through a process that you've already learned about, you will be able to examine the truth about the universe in which we live. And you'll be able to go to the nearest star and to the nearest planets that have life and examine them you'll be able to see them for yourself and therefore experience them. Does that make sense? And this is all possible because you are now no longer limited by the physical form and you now, because you're in the spirit form, you're now not having the same physical limitations. So the answer to the question is, once you become a spirit, you will be able to, for yourself... No, no matter what happens here on earth over the next thousands of years in the discovery of fast and light travel, you will, for yourself, once you become a spirit, be able to answer that question. Now, is the answer to that question valid to you right now, is my next question. So if we hand the mic back to Marina, how is the answer to the question valid for you right now? Does it change your life if you know there are aliens? Significantly, no. No, yeah. but it, in terms of development, like being us created in God's image, like I haven't, the image thing is like planted into my brain, like image, like we look like him, like human form. Yeah, and that's what's out the there, case. Yeah. yeah, and what's yeah. out there could be totally like different. And I guess, you know, these are all ways that I'm, I'm guessing of like the valid ways. I, just probably should have been a scientist and I'm not, but um, it's it just in terms of that. I guess I just try to find logical ways for God's existence when I don't feel that God's there, I guess. So how does the existence of an alien species confirm God's existence, logically? Oh, just like the qualities and attributes, just from, from myself, like for what humans are on Earth. Just, I guess, yeah, there's like that incongruency of like what is... If we're created in his image, what is the image? Is this, is this the word image something different than what I've been raised to think? 
Yes, yeah, so can you see now from a logical perspective, you're now distorting the reasoning of your own logic. So can I give you an illustration? Sure. Yeah. You're saying this statement, God created man... in his image in God's image it's talking about there now where did that statement come from the, uh, from the Bible. Bible yeah it came from the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 right. now what is the Bible something man wrote something man wrote okay so it's man's writings Now, when man wrote that, was there any man who actually had talked to God, like one on one, seen God, any of these kind of things? Aside from yourself, no, I probably no? not. Okay. So, can you see it was not only man's writings, but it was also man's assumption? Now, I think it's a valid assumption. I'm not saying it's not a valid assumption, but it is an assumption, right? And then what you're doing with this assumption here. You've now made an extension with that from a logical perspective somehow into, okay, I don't know what that means. Well, it's for a start, it's a man's assumption. But you're now saying, oh, you're now assuming that it's right. Aren't I you? understand what you mean, yeah. Right, so you're now having to assume that that statement is right. So there's another assumption. And then when you make, so, so you, you want to believe it's correct or it's right or it's true, right? That's what you believe. And then you make another assumption. I don't know what that means. And so what I want now from God is some kind of proof that that's true. But now you're wanting from God proof that a man's assumption is true. Do you see what I'm saying? From a logical perspective, is that the right way to approach any question? No. Because it's just a beginning of, it begins from an assumption. It also shows I'm not very humble when I ask that. Like, lack of humility a little. Yeah, you don't need to condemn yourself for any of those things. It's just not logical. <laughs> what you're doing is not logical. And then what you're doing is you're saying, okay, because that, that's an assumption and I don't understand the assumption, you're now going into the state, well, okay, now what I want from God is some alien life form to appear to me so that I can know for truth that, that if their character is like God's and my character is like God's, like, are our forms different or are our forms the same? If our, if our forms were different, what would it prove? Well, it would make that statement wrong about his image. Would it, though? Oh, I guess. It would only wrong. make it wrong from a, from a physical human, perspective, yeah. I would see it? what you mean, yeah. Not, not from a spiritual perspective or a soul-based perspective. It would only make it wrong from a physical perspective. In other words, like... There, there is this assumption in all of that that man, like God is... What, what's the word? Uh, there's a word for a belief that God looks like a man. Um, anthropomorphic God, isn't it? Right? So there's a belief that God is anthropomorphic. Right? Now, that's probably not a very good assumption either. <laughs> right? Given the fact that God would have to be far more powerful than we are, given the fact that if God created the universe, God would have to have probably far more power and therefore probably couldn't be contained in the same body that we have. Yeah, that makes sense because if I sit and I think about like flowers and colours and things that God created, it, it shows how multifaceted and like there's so much more. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And so that. we can't then assume that God looks like a man. So, but that doesn't mean that this God created man in his image isn't not isn't true it could be just true in a different way than we're assuming from a physical perspective right couldn't it i never thought of that before but yeah. yeah so so this is our problem with making assumptions from men other people and then basing the discovery of truth on these assumptions this is not the great way to discover truth like and and to be honest with you most scientists know that Right? They only usually based, uh, based their assumptions on things that have been proven to be true to them through some kind of experiment, and then they make further assumptions which they try to then prove to be true. But 
they don't make assumptions just based on assumptions that have no proof or no, no underlying proof that nobody can supply. They don't do that. So our desire to do that is very flawed from the beginning. So, so when you go down the track of going, OK, if I saw another al an alien standing next to me and I saw they had a different body, then what does that say about that statement? It's false. Well, only from a physical perspective it says it's physical. false. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> so it doesn't really say anything. It doesn't prove anything. Do you see? So when I hear questions like, do aliens exist? And while I know they do, um, I don't see much point to the question from a logical perspective in terms of developing your faith in God. Does that make sense? The reality is there's six and a half billion, or 7.2, I think, at the moment, billion people on this planet who are highly intelligent at different times of their life. <laughs> and if that's not proof enough that there is intelligence in the universe, then I don't think an alien standing next to them is going to help the situation. Does that make sense? But I will answer your question. I think you are answering with like a... <laughs> Yeah. In direct sort of fashion. What I'm trying to help you do is to look at what emotionally drives the questions that we ask. And a lot of time what emotionally drives questions that we ask is assumptions based on other people's statements that are also assumptions. I guess it's like the lesson to not really listen to what others say unless I investigate certain things for myself or maybe be a little more open-minded, I think. Yeah, but I wouldn't agree that the answer is to not listen to what other people say. I listen That's to what true, because I'm listening to what you're saying. <laughs> I listen to what everybody says. Right? The key then is to analyse it using both your mind, the, you know, the capacity of your intellect, but also analyse it from the point of view of love and from the point of view of faith and the point of view of these other things that we've listed here. And then you can come to certain conclusions which will be only assumptions until you have proven them to be true. The problem is on earth, we want to know things before we go through that process, personally. That's our problem most of the time. We want somebody else to do all the work and then just tell us the answer. And a relationship with God is not possible that way. Somebody else can't do all the work and then you get a relationship with God. Right? And this is one of the biggest false beliefs on this planet, that you can actually have a relationship with God through somebody else doing all the work of discovery for you. You can't. Your personal relationship with God is only possible when you do the work. And you're going to have to do the work if you really want to know. Just like if you wanted to play the piano, would you go like... Marina, you want to play the, let's say you wanted to play the piano. You come up to me I, and say, AJ, you go and play the piano. So I go off and play the piano. It takes me eight years. And I learn how to play the piano. And I come back and you, how has that benefited you in playing the piano? <clears throat> Not at all. <laughs> well, there's only one way it's benefited you. And that is you could learn from me oh. <laughs> what I learned okay, from right. somebody else. Teach me, That's right. the only okay. way, right? Yeah. But it doesn't actually help you if you don't do anything yourself, does it? I've enjoyed playing the piano for eight years. I've gone through the process of learning. I've gone through the process of discovery. But you haven't done all of those things. So who is going to play the piano in eight years' time? I am. And you're still not going to be able to play the piano, right? And this is this exactly the same with our relationship with God. If you expect somebody else to do a little work for you, in the end, they are the one who's going to have the relationship with God, but you're still going to be without one. That's reality. It can only, your relationship personally with God can only happen through your personal effort, through the work you do. And of course, through God's desire to have a relationship with you. That's the only way it's going to happen. And it doesn't matter how many people you ask to do all the work for you, in the end, no matter what work they do for you, it's not going to benefit you. Except in one way, and that is that they can show you what they did by teaching you something. But that's the only way it's going to benefit you. In the end, only you can make the shift. So, so for example, 
me telling you the answer to your question, is there life, uh, alien life forms of higher intelligence or just as much intelligence as ourselves on other planets? Me saying yes to you, which is the actual truth, how does that help you? Well, I guess at the end of the day, I still have to figure that out for myself, whether it's true or not, just because you're telling me. Exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't help you at all. But I have a tendency to believe you in a lot of the stuff you say, too. But that's crazy. Why would you do that? Yeah. Because I guess uh, I feel like just the my own notions are invalid sometimes and there's just someone else in that. That's just my own feelings that I have to feel through, of course. Yep. That, you know, someone else, like the man knows something more than me and things like that. But I don't believe everything you say. Yeah, which is good. <laughs> I wouldn't want you so to So why do you me. believe everything I say? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Why is that? Right. It's crazy to do that. <clears throat> why would you do that? No, I just guess if some of the things that you've taught have resonated with me. And You've discovered them through your own personal right, experience right. to be true. Right. That's the only reason for believing anything that I say yeah. is through your own personal experience, discovering it to be yeah. true. That's what I, yeah, I, I said earlier to Corner, you, were, you have been the only person that has had the more similar or have expressed the more similar ideas than what I have always felt in my life. And that's why I've continued to follow this path, you know, in yes. poor manner sometimes. But yeah. That's but in the end, you trusting what I say without doing something yourself is not going to benefit you, as you know. Yeah. And this is what I'm really getting at. So if we go back to the question, that is there alien life forms on other planets, my answering the question in the affirmative, yes, there is, does not benefit you at all. You still don't know whether that's true. You still don't know whether it's just my own assumption, my own opinion. You, don't, you haven't had my experience where I've gone to have a look at them. So you haven't, you haven't been able to do that at this point. So you don't, and, and you don't even know whether that experience of mine is just a part of my imagination or whether it's actually real. Does that make sense? So these are, this is the problem with some of the questions that we ask is that we often get ourselves like pulled away from the basic principles that we need to discover first. So while we ask ourselves questions about life forms on other planets, you know, all these different things that are similar in nature to that, while we're asking all of those things, we're really distracted from those five primary things that we need to really understand. The beauty of asking questions about these primary things is that they will help you understand logically what questions are worth asking and what questions are not really worth asking at this point. Does that make sense? So while I'm living here in a physical life, Myself asking a question about whether there's alien life forms on other planets has very little bearing on my personal life. It has very little bearing on my personal happiness. It has very little bearing even on my trust in God and faith in God, actually. Because in the end, no matter who answers me and whoever says it to me, unless they can provide physical evidence and proof that their answer is correct, it's pretty much pointless having the discussion. Can you see that? Thanks for taking the time to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I'm suggesting is that this is where we often be, we're often distracted from logic. We become distracted from logic. What we're, what we're doing, what I'm suggesting first is if we develop these qualities first, we focus all of our effort and time and attention on developing these things first, all the other answers will come to you. Now, isn't that what we said in the Bible, isn't it? Like, and that is an actual quote of something I did say, and that is, all these other things, seek first God's kingdom, and all these other things will be added to you. Now, many of us still don't understand that statement. Because what do we do in our life? We seek first everything else other than God's love, and then we expect to know the answers to all of these other things. And we can't know them without seeking first these things. Does that make sense? So, yes, in terms of a brief uh, answer to your question now, yes, there are, is life on other planets. No, they don't look like anything other than humans. In other words, they don't look like, you know, some two-headed monster who has... They all have a soul. These 
life forms. But there are also other types of life, just like on Earth we have other types of life other than human life that range right the way down to single-celled life, right the way up to the human soul. And that is the case on all of these other planets as well. When God makes the human form, God thought the design was pretty good and looks pretty pleasant and so therefore decided to make that design uh, in other locations. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you know how we, myself and Mary have been watching Star Trek uh, lately, Star Trek Enterprise, and you know how there's all these life forms that are um, all very complicated and uh, all these different forms of evolution. The reality is the way God designed the evolutionary process is that it, it's, as God adds love to the system, every single evolutionary process is perfected and therefore results in the same result in the end. So while there are other types of living creatures, like other types of insects, for example, on other planets, that we don't have here on Earth, um, when it comes to the human life form, the very highest of God's creations, which is not the actual human body, but rather the human soul, um, the human soul is very, very much the same everywhere in the universe that you go. That makes sense? But me saying all that, means nothing to you <laughs> because it doesn't there's no way there's no way at the moment that I can verify that to you by providing further evidence there's no way that uh, I can get one of those people to visit you because they have the same problem with how fast we travel as what we have go going there and so we are all got in physically the same limitations at this point in time and, and as a result of those kind of things, it's, it's impossible for somebody to actually provide the physical proof. Now, the question then comes, well, where does all these things like, you know, I, people saying that they've had a, a experiences where they've been snapped up by aliens and, and they've been experimented on or, you know, they have all those kind of things. Now, there are very clear explanations that we can give about all of those particular subjects. And, uh, but I don't know whether that's highly important in terms of my, our time today and tomorrow as to whether you want to know all of those kind of things. But the reality is um, there is an answer to all of those questions. As you would expect from a God who wants to love his children, he wants to give answers to all of his children on every subject possible. That's what you would expect, isn't it? So in the end you should be able to almost answer, ask any question and get a definitive answer with that question. Now, if you are at one with God in love, the definitive answer is going to be a lot easier to both find and also understand than it would be if, you stay in our current, if we stay in our current development where we're not yet at one with God and therefore we've got to go through an experimental process to answer. And that's why I suggest to you Focus first on this, then all of these other answers will be so easy for you to discover in comparison. But what we're often doing is we've, we're not focused on these and we want all the other answers first. And that doesn't make any logical sense to do that. Does that make sense? What makes more logical sense is for us to focus on the way in which we discover truth, which is this way, and and then all the truths that we could ask questions about will be exposed to us through our use of our will to discover, but also because our soul will have the ability to understand the truth that, as it's presented to us. Yeah. So that's my answer to that question. <laughs> um, can we come? If we come over to here, yes. What was your name? Hi, I'm Margaret, Margaret and it's yeah. wonderful to be in the presence of you and Mary. I've spent hours and hours on your... Addicted, I think. Yeah, yes, no, indeed, is, addicted. And I to... notice myself and I actually just stop and say, no, you need to feel something now because you're going to listen to them and they can't give you the answers, what you just said. Exactly. So um, I really have been getting that. So but while anyway. it's okay to listen to what we've got to say, at the end of the day, until you go through the personal emotional experience, you won't know it. 
Yeah, yeah. You but mind? it is so just, I, I mean, I've already had so much emotion just being in your presence without a word. It's just extraordinary. Anyway, yeah. my question is, I'm surprised that prayer isn't on this list here, Be, or unless it sort of encapsulates the list. Because for me, prayer is, um, and you've done, a, you and Mary have done these beautiful segments on faith and prayer from yes. the uh, Solomon, I believe? Uh, yes, pageant correct. Yes, yes. Yep. Um, to me, prayer is where I'm gaining all of this new knowledge and all of this new understanding and all of the courage to feel what I'm afraid to feel and all that. So um, where does prayer fit in is my question. Well, prayer fits in all of them, obviously. There, there is all of these aspects of ourselves that we need to develop can only really be developed by receiving love from God in the end. And the only way in which to receive love from God is to pray as long as we know what prayer is which, is, which is in the end having a heartfelt, passionate desire to receive love from God, isn't it? So, so yes, that is a very powerful transform transformative process. However, um, it's a very simple answer to prayer, whereas the answer to all of these things are far more com complex, aren't they? So the way I feel about prayer is that it fits into every one of these things. It's a bit like most other things that we can choose to do. They fit into one of these five things somewhere. So while I agree with you that prayer, the two most important things in the universe are prayer and faith. Prayer, in other words, the desire to receive love from God as a passionate feeling and faith in that we're going to receive it, the faith that it's possible. Those two things are very, very essential and are the most important things. They are not necessarily the things that we will ask lots of our questions about because usually it's other areas of our life that are causing us to not pray and it's other areas of our life that are causing us to not have faith and it's other areas of our life that cause us to not ask God for love. And it's other feelings and emotions that we have that we're, that we're trying to shut down that cause us to not allow ourselves to go through those two basic things. And so this is why these questions involving these things are quite important because it breaks down our resistance to prayer. Right? If you have no faith, you will not pray. If you do not use your will to pray, you will not pray. If you don't have a humble heart, you will not receive love. You will not even desire it in, in many cases. If you don't have an openness to feeling and emotion of love, you will not pray. Right? So while prayer affects every one of these things, it's, every, it's knowing more about any of these things that helps break down your resistance to prayer. And the main problem that we have is that we have resistance to prayer, resistance to faith. They are our primary problems. If, if we had no resistance to prayer and no resistance to faith, we would all already be at one with God if, as soon as we desired to have a relationship with God. It's only our resistance to prayer and our resistance to faith that causes us to not be right at this moment at one with God. So if we're going to ask questions, we're best focusing on where our resistances are. Can you see that? What, what is going to help us open up to prayer? What is going to help us open up to faith? And these are the things that we will need to develop in order for those things to occur. Without faith, you will not pray. Without using your will or understanding how your will works, you will not pray. See, the, this, is, this one here, using your will, is very much about your soul. What, what, what is your soul? Like how do you pray? Can you pray from your mind or do you, how, how do you pray? Well, that, that's all about understanding the soul. That's all about understanding the will of the soul. Right? So I feel that, still feel that these are the questions that we will focus on because they will help break down your resistance to your relationship with God. If none of us had resistance to our relationship with God, as soon as we had a desire for a relationship with God, we'd have one to the point of at one with God. It's only our resistance that causes that process to not occur. Yep. Katerina? Uh, after I heard the seminar you had about prayer 
and, and God and faith, I understood something. There's, for me, there was uh, all of a sudden two kinds of prayer. The kind for the things I asked for myself, and then the kind of prayer that would go to God. But what I wonder is this. Um, if I want to create some things in my life, would I, sh should I not be addressing my soul because I'm the creator of my life? Mm -hmm. So, because I've started experimenting with this the past three months, and I see it working in the sense, I don't ask for God to help me, per se, with my job or my relationship. Yep. I try to talk to my soul and see why she doesn't want those things to occur. Yep. So, I'm actually starting to have a relationship with my soul because I'm understanding, okay, I'm not at the level where when I pray it reaches God, because it just doesn't go to God. But, well, see, if you really pray, it always goes to God. Right. And this is what I thought. That, so I am understanding what Mary had said. Okay, I am not at the level of soul condition to want to have that relationship with God. Yep. To where my prayer is going to reach him. And I'm understanding that. Well, no, no. Let's be careful about prayer. Can I, can I first say a few things about prayer? Um, I just need to... I want to keep some of this stuff on the board because... We'll probably refer to it. So I'll just get rid of a bit here. And if we look at prayer. Prayer is the sincere, heartfelt longing for love from God. That's what it is. There's no such thing as a prayer that's not that. That is the definition of prayer. So you know when you have an intellectual thought for God, that's not a prayer. When you have an intellectual thought that you want some selfish emotion you know, to be better, that's not prayer. Okay. The prayer is always a sincere, heartfelt longing for God. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. That's the definition of prayer. There's no such thing as being out and not like... There's no alternative definition to prayer. Now, the reason why I point that out is that we often sometimes say... If I pray, it's not reaching God. No, I'm sorry. Every time you pray, it will reach God. Because the definition of prayer is a sincere, heartfelt longing. <laughs> and that means that God will feel it every single time. That's the definition of prayer. So, so if you think you have a heartfelt longing for God and don't receive any answers on the particular subject, the only answer can be that it wasn't prayer. And therefore, it wasn't sincere, it wasn't heartfelt, it wasn't something along those lines. Because every time you have a sincere, heartfelt longing for God, you will receive. That's prayer. So prayer is not about, oh God, please help me with my work situation. Or that's not prayer, actually. That's just a well, call be. for help. No, it could be a call for help if it's heartfelt and driven by sincerity. But you might only want help at work because you want to get rid of some person who, at work who's just causing you trouble, right? So you might be going, you might be going, please help me at work, but the feeling in you is, is you don't want to say to God, get rid of that person from my work, right? <laughs> because you know that wouldn't be sincere. So what you do instead of that, rather than feeling that, you, you go, oh, no, what I'll do is I'll ask for God for help at work, right? But really what you're looking for is to get rid of the person who's at work that's causing you trouble. That's really what you want. You don't want... And so you don't want something that's sincere. Do you see? Yes. That's not prayer anymore. Because prayer is always a sincere, heartfelt... You see? A heartfelt longing. That's the definition of prayer. So, so when we have a feeling coming out of us, you know, we tell ourselves all sorts of things, don't we? So in that situation, you might go, um, yeah, I can't really pray that the person gets sacked. That's what I'd like. <laughs> right? But I can't really pray it to God because I know God's probably not going to answer that. But the feeling that I have inside of me is I want them to get sacked so that I can get rid of them out of my life. Now, that, that is the feeling coming out of you. And so any time you even have a thought of, oh, God, can you help me at work? When the feeling coming out of you is just sack the person who's causing, you know, in Australia, excuse the French, but we would, it's 
is there a saying here, excuse the French, which is, yeah. excuse the swear word, but we'd say, get rid of the bastard, right? That's the feeling inside of us, right? Then how can we then say to God, oh, would you help me at work, when that feeling is the prayer? The feeling coming out of us is, I just want you to get rid of that person out of my life. Now, that's where our prayers are no longer sincere and therefore they are no longer prayers because the only form of prayer is sincere. That's the only form of prayer. There is no other definition of prayer. Um, it has to be a sincere, pure, heartfelt desire and longing inside of your soul for something. So if your sincere, pure, heartfelt desire inside of your soul is get rid of somebody out of your life, that's the prayer that you're really sending. And then the question is going to become, well, is God going to answer that prayer? Probably not. Of course God's not going to answer that prayer because it's not in harmony with God's love. So God's not going to answer that prayer. You see? But that is the prayer coming out of your soul. Anything that's a sincere, heartfelt longing is the real thing coming out of your soul. So, you know, in the course of a day, many of us have a sincere, heartfelt longing that somebody dies. Now, of course, God's not going to answer that prayer, but that's the feeling coming out of us towards different people. Right? We might have a sincere, heartfelt longing that somebody has an accident because we're sick and tired. <laughs> the, you know, we have a lot of anger in us sometimes, and we have a sincere, heartfelt longing that they actually... Something bad happens to them so that you can, we can say, see, I told you something bad is going to happen to you and look what's happened. And, you know, in Australia that, that's called like pointing the bone at somebody, you know, like making them have something bad happen in their life. That's a sincere heartfelt prayer, but it's not a prayer that God will answer. Right? Because all of God's answers come in harmony with God's love. So the only prayer that you can have that God will actually answer will be in harmony with God's love. So you can ask for help at work. That can be a sincere, heartfelt longing. But if, if, the, if the sincere, heartfelt longing is get rid of that person so I can be happier, then obviously God's going to go, well, there's your sincere, heartfelt longing. So when, when Katerina's praying to God saying, please make my work life easier, let's say that was the prayer. When the sincere heartfelt longing coming out of Katerina at that time is, please get rid of that person for me so I can have a happier work life, then God can't answer that prayer. But, but what I'm saying is that I would actually not ask that of God because I'm understanding that I'm the creator of my life. So would I not talk to my soul and say, okay, I, why do I desire to be in a bad situation or why do I desire to be in this situation? A specific place let's like work together so we can move forward or move in a better place so I would not per se ask God for any of that I would ask myself why do I feel the need to be stagnant or to be here or to be yeah I, I don't ask myself I ask God yeah. what can you see that asking yourself is almost self-reliance like yeah. well I know what you're trying to get at so what you're trying to get at is this, that your soul creates everything around you. So if something around you is going to change, your soul has to change. I do agree with that. Right? That is true. But is it easier to ask God to help change your soul or to change your soul yourself? Oh, yeah. Which is easier. It's easier with God. Yeah, with if, we, if we receive God's love into our soul... If I receive God's love into my soul, that will cause changes in my soul. Do you understand? And that will make it easier for me to be loving and therefore also cause my soul to grow and, and therefore cause my soul to have different attractions. Right? Now, all I've got to do, really, is work out all the ways that I'm blocking God's love entering my soul. That's all I've got to do. Right? And that's the only work I really have to do. I don't have to figure out everything. I've just got to work 
out all the ways I'm blocking God's love. That's all I've got to do. And if I really wanted a relationship with God, that's what I would spend all of my life and time doing, finding out every single way that I am blocking the flow of God's love into my soul. Because if I allow God's love into my soul, it will transform my soul. It will. God's love will. So that'll do the work. I've just got to work out why I'm stopping it from doing the work. That's all I've got to do. I don't have to work out anything else. I will naturally become more loving. I will naturally become more, more knowledgeable through the process of receiving God's love. Does that make sense, Katerina? Yeah, I was going about it the hard way. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So what I focus on, if I'm not receiving God's love at any point in time, my, my only questions are, what inside of me causes me to block the flow of God's love into me? What's blocking me? Now, one thing that could be blocking me is that I'm not being loving to my brothers and sisters. And that will certainly block the flow of God's love. It could be that I use my will to do everything else but ask for God's love. It could be that I have no humility. I think I don't need God's love. Right? It could be that I have no desire to understand any truth. I, I, I'm blocking truths. You know? God's trying to reflect truth to me all the time, showing me where I'm blocking God's love. And I'm going, no, it's not that. It can't be that. I'm already good at that. Right? It's not that. You know? And many of you do that in our conversations with you. Right? Those of you who've had personal conversations with me, many of you have had this process where you come up and you say, oh, what's stopping me from receiving God's love? So I say, say, what I feel at that point in time is the biggest thing stopping you. And most of the time, the answer I get is, no, it's not that. I don't even know what you're talking about. So it's not that. And so we then ignore that. Right? That's what we do. And it's our choice, the use of our will, to ignore all of these things that are coming to us, telling us where we're not sincere, where we're not pure, where we're not having a sincere longing for God's love, that blocks us to the reception of God's love. If we're blocked to the reception of God's love, we are not going to have the transformative effect of God's love on our soul, and therefore every change we make is going to have to be driven by our own will. But if we receive God's love into our soul, every transformation that occurs in our soul will be as a result of God's love transforming our soul. So all I have to do is focus my, intent, my intention and my, my will towards working through all the reasons why I block God's love, why I try to keep it away from me. What do I do that prevents God's love from flowing into my soul? And some of the things I do are things that I do to others that prevent me from receiving love. Some of the things I do, I do to myself that prevent me from receiving love. Some of the things I do, I do with God that prevents me from receiving love. Some of the things I do, I do to God's creations. You know, like I, things like I might eat meat, for example, when I, have the, I could choose to be more loving and not do that. That is going to block me to God's love at some point. Does that make sense? I am choosing to do things that are often out of harmony with the reception of God's love. All I've got to do is find out all of the things that I'm doing. I don't have to do anything else. I don't have to change my soul because God's love will change my soul. All I've got to do is find out all the reasons why I'm blocked and my soul changing. That's all I have to do. Can you see the difference? Thank you, yes. Yes, yeah. I do. It's very important to understand that difference, Katerina, because what I see a lot of people doing is the same kind of thing where they're not focused on looking at God's love as being the transformative effect. So in other words, they're not going to themselves, God's love is going to change me. So that's the reality. If God's love enters you, it will change you automatically. The thing I saw for me is that I did not have such a desire. So this is why I turned inward to see, okay, why don't I have this desire? Uh, exactly. I keep thinking of it all the time. I keep, it's in my head. But I even to... with that, you can say, God, show me why I don't have a desire. 
Now, the reality is, though, God is like a loving parent. Every single day, hour, minute, second of your existence, God is trying to show you why you don't have a desire. And you're just ignoring it, right? So what we really need to do is find out, okay, why am I ignoring all of the messages that I'm getting? So, and usually we do that because of our addictions. It's our addictions that often drive us to not see what's going on, right? So if I can give some examples about that. So in your own life, if we look at your own life, if that's okay. Sure. You. Okay. So what are your addictions that prevent you from receiving love? In general or from God? Well, that's the question you need to ask yourself. Um. What are your addictions that prevent you? What are your addictions that stop you from being sincere? Now, the addictions you know are not the problem. Right. Because you already know them. Because, yeah. <laughs> right? and, I, and I've seen so many. Um, yes, yes. Uh, and some of the ones you know you don't want to change. Right. But even that's not the problem. The real problem is the addictions you don't know. They're the real problem. The addictions that you think are not addictions at all. They are the real problems. Does that make sense? Yes. Because if you think about what's preventing you, if, bear in mind prayer is this sincere, heartfelt desire, passionate desire for the longing for God's love. Now, if I'm not receiving God's love at any point in time, it's got to be because something inside of me is blocking the reception. Now, it can only be how I'm using my faith, using my will, using my humility, using truth, or my current focus on love. It's stopping the flow of love. It can only be one of those five things generally. Right? Now, if I look at all of those things and I go, I've got no idea what it is. Because sometimes it's like that, isn't it? Like you go, you know, I've been longing for love for the last year now. I received love. Last time I received love was a year ago. And I haven't received any love since then. And I know I haven't, right? So I go, okay, for a whole year I've been blocking obviously. I've been blocking the flow of God's love. Now, God's love is the thing that's going to change me, so I need to have it in me to change me. So if it's not in me, then I've got to be doing something. There's some action personally that I have to be taking to not receive it. So the question then becomes, well, what is it? Now, most of the time, we've got all of these addictions and fears and other things in play, right? All this, all this year, there's been those things. Now, what's been happening? Here's your soul. So here's Katerina's soul. It's a feminine soul. Attracting events all through that year. Your soul's like this big attraction going... Send me events, send me events, send me events based on my condition, right? So you've been attracting events all through the year. The problem is that many of those events you believe are normal or good when actually they're telling you something that your soul is blocking the relationship with God. Right? So uh, example, I'll give you some examples. There was a guy who came up to me in Australia and he says, I've got this wonderful attraction with women. Anything that I want, they'll give me. And I go, and you don't see any problem with that? <laughs> you mean anything you want, you get given? Yes, he said yes. Now, if I want to go to bed with them, they'll come to bed with me. If I want, to, if I, if I want, to, I want some money from them, they'll give me some money. Anything I want. Aren't I a powerful soul? I said, yeah, you're a very powerful negative soul. Because yeah? that's not in harmony with God's love. All right? It is what his soul attracted. And I would say to him, I said to him, your soul is attracting women who just bend over backwards to do anything you want. This is telling you a big problem that you have, that you actually expect women to bend over backwards and give you anything you want. This is a big injury in your soul. It's not actually a great big positive thing in your soul. It's a big injury in the soul. And he was thinking that it was a big positive thing. He thought it was wonderful. Now, can you see that sometimes all the things we think are wonderful are not so wonderful? 
Like I know women, for example, that we meet frequently in Australia who get everything they want from a man. Everything. And they think it's wonderful. And it's terrible for their soul. Terrible for their soul. Right? They're not looking at what their soul damage is causing. But they attract it every day. And so when I attract somebody doing something for me, the first question I ask myself is, does this person really want to do that? Second question I ask myself is, is what they want to do in harmony with God's love? Third thing I ask, is what they want to do in harmony with their love of themselves? If my answer to those three questions is no, it's not in harmony to any of those things or one of those things, I will not accept what they will give me. Does that make sense? Because if I'm in harmony with love of God, I would not want to accept them doing something that would harm themselves. I would not want to accept them doing something that would harm their relationship with God or their relationship with their soulmate or their relationship with themselves. I wouldn't want to accept it. The fact that I get it and I like it is a problem when it's out of harmony with God's love. But the majority of us don't think that. What the majority of us do is we go, it's great when we get what we want, even if what we want is out of harmony with God's love. We think it's great. Well, God doesn't think it's great. God's trying to correct us <laughs> from that position. We can't receive love from God under those circumstances, right? When we want things from God that are out of harmony with God's love, we will not receive love from God. And if we want things from others that are out of harmony with God's love, we will not receive love from God. It's quite simple. It's only ourselves that can block the flow of love. So if for a year we are totally clueless as to... We know that we haven't received love, but for a whole year we're totally clueless as to why, it's because God's already been showing us heaps of things during that year and we are totally desirous of being completely unaware of what God's been showing us. So the very first prayer we need to really have is a sincere one. I am completely unaware of what you've been, to show, been trying to show me for the last year. That, that's, that's a statement of truth. Because if you were aware, you would be receiving God's love, right? So you've got to be completely unaware. And if you're completely unaware, the first desire that needs to develop, using your will, is I want to know what I'm unaware of. I want to know what it is that's stopping the flow of God's love to me, to my soul. Does that make sense? That's what I would be focused on every single time. And what I see happening frequently is the majority of people do not want to focus on that. They, they want to remain unaware. They want to live in their addictions and they even want their addictions to be good. Right? In other words, they want God to accept their addictions and still give love when those addictions are out of harmony with God's love. God's love can only flow into a soul who at the moment, at that very moment, desires in, with sincerity and purity to receive that love. And that is going to be the thing that transforms you, the love itself. So, so my suggestion to people is this. If we have not been receiving God's love, in the, whatever the period of time we have not been receiving God's love is, there has been events, right? And I'll throw that one away because that one's. Honest. There's events that have been happening during that period of time that have been exposing to us the reason why we have not been receiving love, and we've been in total ignorance of those events. In other words, we probably think those events are good, but they're not. Right? They're showing us something else. Right? Because our attractions are always there. If we really want to know the truth from God, God will always show us the truth. Our personal experiences, within minutes or seconds, within minutes or seconds, we'll get shown the truth. Yep. And if it's not happening within minutes or seconds, then it's highly likely we don't want to know the truth in that moment. Right? We just think we do. And this is why I'm saying focus on these things because those things will expose everything for you. And don't, you don't have to change yourself. 
God's love will change you. That's what it does. It transforms the soul. So God's love will change you. All you need to do is worry about how to receive more of it. How do you, what is, what's happening within, within you at the moment that's blocking the reception of it? That's all you need to worry about. You don't need to worry about much else. So I see people getting all concerned about this emotion and that emotion and this feeling and that feeling and what's going on here, what's going on here. And those are not the things I do personally. What I do personally is I ask myself, these, I'm always focused on these five basic principles for myself. And I'm always asking myself, what inside of me is stopping the flow of God's love into me? That's what I need to focus my attention on. And that's the only thing I have to focus my attention on. I don't try to change myself. I know God's love will change me if I can receive it. So I don't try to change myself. What I try to do is find out the reasons why I'm blocked to receiving God's love at any point in time. That's what I try to do. That's where my effort goes. Yep. You don't have to change yourself because God's love will change you if you receive it. So all you need to work out is how to receive it. That's all you need to do. And you need to work out how it's, you're blocking it. That's all you need to do. You don't have to do anything more complicated than that. And when I say anything more complicated than that, sometimes you can go a whole year not working out why. <laughs> you can. You know, that's the reality, you can. But you could only go a whole year if there was not a sincere desire to know. That's the reality too. Yep. Does that make sense? Because as soon as there is a sincere desire to know, God answers every prayer that's in harmony with God's love. God will answer that prayer too. As soon as you have a real sincere desire to know what's going on inside of your soul that prevents the flow of love from God, God will be able to show you, in that moment even, what is the real problem. And often what I've found personally is God's been showing me the entire time. Right? Day after day after day after day after day after day. And I'm just like, oh, oh, I don't know. Or, or ignorant or, or going, I don't want to know that. Or... I'm blocking something, right, in terms of the knowledge of it. But God's been trying to show me the entire time. And then I go, oh, oh, it's that. Oh, that makes sense because I've been showing that for the last year every single day. Right? And that's our problem with our awareness. We often have problems with our awareness. And we have problems with our awareness because we don't want to know. We don't really want to know. Thank you. Okay, can we come straight behind here and then over to Pamela here. What was your name? Sorry. My name is, oh, my name is Ruth. How are you, Ruth? Okay. Um, thanks for coming to Philly. Pleasure. Um, I have uh, one question that is bothering me. What do you feel about eating fish? Because in the first century, you helped the fishermen catch fish. And so what is, can you explain that? Well, up until I was a one with God, so this was before I was a one with God in the first century, I mended the nets of fishermen. Yes. But I didn't personally eat their fish. Um, I realised that that was what they wanted to do, fish and feed other people fish, but I never ate it personally. I stopped eating meat in the first century when I was 13 years old. And the reason why I stopped then was because I went to the temple and uh, because of the sacrifices in the temple that were occurring, there was blood. It was very smelly. There were blood running down the sides of the temple sometimes. And they had a... It was almost like a... Um, well, it was a market for meat, um, basically, in the temple, uh, mostly because they used it for sacrifice, right? And there was so much smell and poor behaviour of humans towards animals in that moment that I observed that I just couldn't eat meat ever again and so I didn't that being said it was the feeling in my soul that drove me to do that the feeling to love 
in this case to love God's creatures. If the feeling in your soul doesn't drive you to do that, doesn't drive you to, to give up meat in your day-to-day -day life, then what I would be focused on is, why well, don't I have the feeling in my soul yet? Because once you've received divine love to a certain point, you will get to the point where you will no longer want to eat meat. You will, automatically. And that's fish included, every form of meat. Can, can I ask one more question? Sure. Can you tell me the logic behind the whole sacrificial system in the Old Testament? Um, well, there is no logic behind it. Well, that's, the, I mean... <laughs> that's the reality. But let's look at why it was invented, shall we? Because it's important to understand sometimes why people have created specific belief systems. If we look at sacrifice, which is a... I often hear from people, and this is very common in your society, by the way, here in the States, that sacrifice is a proof of love. So whenever a mother sacrifices for her children, it's a proof that she loves her child. Whenever a person sacrifices for another person, it's a proof that they love the other person. Now, years ago, like we're now talking millenniums ago, thousands of years ago, there was this concept in humanity that God required sacrifice in order to give gifts. So they had a very undeveloped viewpoint of God's love. They believed that God's love was dependent upon sacrificing for God. So in other words, giving something to God, and if you gave something to God, you would receive something from God, was their basic principle of understanding God's nature. Now, of course, God's not like that, but a lot of people are like that. So the reason why we've grown up with these belief systems is because most people think that way. Most people believe that if you sacrifice something for them, then it means you loved them. Most people believe that. And most people for, millennium have, for millennia have believed that. It's not actually true. There are many people who sacrifice things for other people without loving them at all. But, uh, and in fact, many people sacrifice for very selfish reasons, um, guilt and other emotions. But it is a common belief on the planet. Now, as a result of that, what they used to do was sacrifice their own children. So the very firstborn child that they had, that, was, that, was, uh, that grew to usually, you know, in the prime of their youth, usually in the teenage years, they would sacrifice that child to God. And some religious faiths, this was prior to Christianity and prior to the Jewish religion, would sacrifice those children as babies. And they would either do it with the sword or they would do it by burning the baby alive, but they'd view that as a sacrifice to God. And they did it because they believed that any time they sacrificed for God, then God would give them more things. That's why they did it. Now, the Jewish faith modified that a bit. It became a bit more loving in the sense that instead of sacrificing children they substituted children for animals. So it began with Abraham, who was basically educated by a spirit to sacrifice a child, <clears throat> sorry, to sacrifice for his child Isaac, his firstborn, instead of sacrificing Isaac, to sacrifice an animal, a sheep, instead. And that's where it began, to sacrifice an animal rather than sacrificing the human. But it's still the same principle, that if we sacrifice for God, that God will give us things. It makes no logical sense because God already has those things. God already has ownership of our child, and in fact it is God's child, and God already has ownership of every single living thing that's ever been created, so it makes no sense to sacrifice it if God already created it. God already has it. So there's no logical sense of what it would do for humanity. But there was this opinion 
and that if they did sacrifice, that they'd have a better year next year and more abundance next year and so forth. And a lot of times they did actually, but not because of God. It was because of the spirit help they would receive. So in other words, there were spirits who would give them more assistance if they gave the spirits allegiance. And uh, so it was very much a perpetrated thing by spirits rather than by God. Now, what happened in Christianity is it just got converted to my life. One sacrifice for everyone's sins. Rather than having to sacrifice every single year for the sins. So it was an improvement in the sense that less animals died. But, but still flawed concept. That there's nothing I can do to make your sins go away aside from help you work through receiving God's love to help your sins go away. There's nothing I can do other than that. But um, the concept of Christianity is that that's possible, that, I, that my sacrifice would make the sins of humanity go away, if there was a belief in my sacrifice. Of course, it has no logical argument to it either. There's no logical reason for believing it. Now, in the FAQ uh, on YouTube, if you go through the FAQ channel that we've done, I've gone through a heap of questions about the sacrifice. There's a heap of questions there about the Christian religious faith and sacrifice, where it came from, and the whole concept of sacrifice and what emotionally drives it. But it's actually a very flawed concept of love that drives the whole concept of sacrifice. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it was always very hard for me to understand that, how an animal can ab absolve you of your sins to kill an animal. Yeah. Is there some relief that happened a little bit or something? Or like, I, I, can, I don't know. I just, I, I can't understand that. Yeah, there's no relief that comes from sacrifice at all. The, the problem is that many of us are addicted to the sacrifices of others to prove to us that they love us. So in other words, what we've done is we believe that when somebody sacrifices for me, it means they love me. It means nothing of the kind. It could, well, it could mean it, but it could also mean a lot of other things. Um, the reality is God doesn't need any sacrifices because God already has everything. God doesn't need us to sacrifice. God needs us to obey. And in the Bible, there's a very interesting quote. Uh, it comes from the Hebrew Scriptures of the Bible. Very interesting quote. It says, To obey is better than a sacrifice. And particularly if you obey God's laws of love, that is far better than any sacrifice that you could make for God. Yeah, but sense? we're all vulnerable. We all sin. I mean, we can't... That's just human nature, sort of. No, it's not human nature. Um, it's, it's our choice to sin. The way God created it is that he, he created us perfect. And in fact, if you look at the Bible, it says very plainly in uh, Matthew that you must become perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So, like, I would never have said those words if I didn't think that humanity could, become, could not be ever become perfect. The reality is we can all become perfect. And we've got to stop this concept inside of us that it's not possible. See, this is where faith is required. We need to have faith that God created us with perfection. Does that make sense? We need to have faith in that. Did the lights just go down? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a signal. Thanks, Ted. If you can put it a bit brighter, that'd be good. He's trying to adjust the air con, aren't you? Yeah. But the lights went down instead. That's all right. Now, the concept of, of sacrificing is a very, very flawed concept on a lot of levels. And my suggestion is to have a look at some of the frequently asked questions that we've asked, answered that question. We even go through the emotional reasons why people want to believe in sacrifice. And those emotional reasons are often quite flawed and selfish, actually. We want proof of love. And one of the ways that we think love is proven is by somebody sacrificing for us. Now, the main reason why we want proof of love is because we can't feel love. Because if we could feel love, we wouldn't need proof of it. Does that make sense? 
So if somebody really loves you and you felt it, you wouldn't need them to go off and sacrifice their child to prove that they loved you. Does that make sense? You wouldn't need them to do that. And in fact, if anybody today in your society said, I'm going to slaughter my child so that I can prove to you that I love you, you'd go, don't do that. And in fact, your society would put them in prison probably for a, a good 15 to 20 year period, right? If they chose to do that. And yet we have that concept of God. In other words, we have a concept of God that is even worse than the concept of, that we have towards other humans. If I chose to sacrifice my child in order to prove to you that I loved you and you wanted that from me, can you see that you'd want some pretty dark things from me? You would never want that, would you? You wouldn't want me to kill my own child just to prove to you that, that I love you. So why would we then assume that God would want such a thing? You know, it's, not, it's crazy to assume that God would want such a thing. Can I ask one more? <laughs> sure you can ask one more. Okay. T can you tell me something about what happens to animals when they die? Like the sort, Yeah, they, I've answered that question quite a few times before. Uh, but basically, they have a spirit body. They don't have a soul. So they pass into the spirit world, and they're still alive in the spirit world. And that applies if they have a central nervous system. If they don't have a central nervous system... So there's, some, there's quite a number of creatures on Earth that don't have a central nervous system. Most insects fall into that category. They have a distributed nervous system. They do not pass into the spirit world. So in other words, when an insect dies, it dies. So what do these, anim these animals roam around the spirit world? Do yeah, I mean, there's, so there's... Can you see your animal? Yeah, you... yes. And in fact, uh, for many people who have pets, sometimes their pets will stay with them for many years in the spirit world. And um, for many people who... You, you, there's, whole, there's whole places you can go to and see all the dinosaurs and you see, like, yes. You can see all the animals that have ever lived on this earth in the past and present. Yeah. If they have a central nervous system. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's, there's, there's dinosaurs in the spirit world. There's whole places you can go to and just stay there and study them. Like, what is their mentality? How do they have a relationship with you? I mean, there must be something more to them than just... Well, it's the same being... way that animals have a relationship with you on Earth, and that is through your soul condition. So, in other words, whatever you feel in your soul, they actually have a relationship with that feeling coming out of your soul. So, when you're in the spirit world, it's the same. If you're in the spirit world and the animal's in the spirit world, the way it has a relationship with you is through the condition of your soul. So... A person in the hells goes and visits the dinosaurs. They are freaked out of their brain, scared most of the time. But if a person from the celestial spirit goes and visits the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs respond completely differently. Because it's the, it's the response to the soul condition of the person. Does that make sense? And this is something we don't understand very well on Earth. On Earth, we don't understand that how the animals are currently acting around us, particularly the wild animals are a complete reflection of our own soul condition, collectively. But in the spirit world, that becomes very plain to see when you go and visit some of these locations. Because the animals respond to your condition. So if your condition is really loving, then you have a good time with the animals, and there is almost a form of communication between them, between you and them, in the sense that they can feel your feelings, they respond to your feelings. And so any feelings that you have, they are responding to each time. Um, and that's a f form of communication, really. And they are always responding to your soul in that regard. But if you're in the condition of not having any love at all when you visit those locations, they'll come running at you, stomp on you, try to stomp on you. Of course, you've got a spirit body. You can't die. But a lot of people who visit those locations in a poor condition are very frightened as a result. What happens when you jump to another spiritual realm? Do you, your animals follow you? or It depends on their personal connection with you as to how far they follow you. So if, if they're personally connected with you, they'll, they'll follow you a long way through the spirit realm, actually. They are not limited in their location like humans are because humans are the persons with a soul and it's your soul condition that determines your location. 
for animals, it's not their, they don't have a soul, so their condition can be any, they, they can live anywhere in the spirit realms, right up to the top of the celestial spheres, mm -hmm. just before the soul union takes place. They can live in any place before then. Does that make sense? And if you have a connection with them, they will follow you. So in a certain sense, they're not flawed like we are. In a Correct. Mm -hmm. they're only, the, the only flaws that they exhibit are our own flaws in reflection. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they respond to the condition of our soul. Yeah. They reflect to us the condition of our own soul. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If we come over here. Oh, sorry, I said Pam was next. Thing I said. Let's go to Pam there. Yeah, yeah. Do I have to turn this off? Okay. That's okay? Oh, yes. Yeah, you've got to talk into the right, <laughs> <end>, otherwise <laughs> it doesn't work. I heard um, one of your YouTube videos, and you discussed um, going into the second and third spheres, and I'm fascinated with that, and I wanted to know, what does it feel like when you move from one sphere to another? How do you know? Well, how you know in the spirit world is very different to how you know on earth. Does that make sense? So if you were in the spirit world, how you would know is that you would be in a new location that's much brighter in its condition of love, much more, uh, much more loving surroundings. The people around you would be much more loving in their reflection. And so you would know that there's a new location. But also the locations are separated by interstellar boundaries. So... So the interstellar boundary is a, is a large gap of, light, of many hundreds of light years, generally, between one boundary and the other. So once you, before, you can make the before you make the transition, you can't make the jump between, of that interstellar boundary. You can't m move yourself, if you like, into the new sphere. Once you change in your soul condition, you can now make the jump of that interstellar boundary. Does that make sense? So you now know that your condition must have improved. Right? So it's quite easy to tell in the spirit world as to how your condition has changed. On earth, it's much more difficult to tell. And the reason why is because your surroundings do not change. It's only the law of attraction that brings you different events that causes the change in your life on earth. So, so if we look at it from a spirit perspective, if I'm a spirit and I'm asking the question, how do I know that I've just made an improvement in my condition of love? Well, the way I know is that I might be consigned to this realm. So let's call that the first sphere, right? And over here, there is an interstellar gap of many hundreds of light years, right? that if I try to circumnavigate the gap using my will, I can't get across it. So that tells me that I've yet to make the transition from the first sphere to the second sphere. If I use my will and I can get across that gap, it means that I've now grown in love in my soul to enable myself to make that transition. Does that make sense? So it's quite simple for me because... In this first sphere condition, I had certain surroundings which were all, to, you know, and in the first sphere, the surroundings vary from the hills right the way through to summer land in the first sphere. And then the second sphere is like exponentially more incredible than the first sphere in terms of more loving, more beautiful. The surroundings are more pleasant to exist in. And, and because of that, once I've made the transition, my entire life has changed reflected back to me my changing condition. So that's if I'm a spirit. If I'm on earth now, how do I know I've made that transition? Because I've still got a physical body and my physical body can't cover interstellar gaps. Right? It's only my spirit body that could cover the interstellar gaps. So, and unless I'm aware of my sleep state condition which most people by the second sphere are not aware, there's no other way for me to know for certain that I've made this transition from a physical measuring perspective. What will change, however, is my attractions, what I attract. The more loving you become, the more your attractions change. 
Now, unfortunately on Earth, the attractions change in two directions. When I'm in a more loving condition, I am now more confronting to the people that are in an unloving condition. So on Earth, the Earth is in a first sphere condition, and now when I'm in a more loving condition, I'm in a second sphere condition, I become more confronting to the people around me. But I'm not confronting from an angry perspective or I'm, because I'm more loving. It's, it's just that people are challenged more by what I say than by what I do. See, in the first sphere, most people are challenged by what you do because you're just unloving most of the time, right? So they get challenged by what you do. But when you progress to the second dimension or the second sphere in terms of condition of love, your, the love comes out of you more. So that changes what you attract. Now, anybody who's attracted to love will find you a more pleasant person to, do, to be with. But anybody who doesn't like love or finds love difficult to accept or finds truth difficult to accept in particular, they will, find, they will feel more confronted by your presence. So they'll like you still, right? But they feel more confronted by being with you. But not only that, what happens is your surroundings start to change. The plants around you and the animals around you and all these other things around you can feel your growth in love. So they all change in the way they treat you. All right? So that all changes. And then in addition to that, what you attract from the universe changes. So in other words, the amount of funds you, you attract into your life the experiences you attract in your life become more enjoyable. And most importantly, you feel more love for everyone. And you feel more desire to be loving to others. Does that make sense? That's all the thing. They're all the thing. And, and you feel, when you make this first to second sphere transaction, you feel more desire to be more truthful. You're no longer driven by fear as much. So fear, instead of fear dictating your life, fear governs your life a lot less when you make that transition. Does that make sense? So the biggest measurable differences are internal. But because you're not living in a new location, as if you would be in your spirit world, you would be living in a new location, it's, it's harder to determine it if you can't feel so this is why you need to, one of the reasons why you need to feel. The more you feel, the more you know what's going on and therefore the more you'll feel your condition change. So you won't be measuring it by what people give you. You'll be measuring it by what you feel for other people. Now, for many of us, we're not honest about what we feel about other people because we often feel challenged, angry, resentful. We often feel these emotions, right? Well, once you make growth in love, you feel less of those emotions. So you feel more love for people, not less. You, you, know, you feel more connected with people, not less connected. You feel more like you understand why people do what they do, not less understanding. These are all the transitions that happen internally. Yep. Yeah. Does that help? Once the transitions are internal, you will know that you've changed. Until then, you'll have to ask somebody else whether you've changed, probably. Right? And the key with all of your life, I feel, is this. Look back over the years. So let's say the gap between change is going to have years associated with it, right? So... Look back over the years and ask yourself some basic questions. Am I more loving now than I was a year ago? Have my, has my relationship with my partner, if I've got one, changed in that time and become more loving? Has my relationship with myself become more loving? Have, is the way that I feel about other people more loving than I used to feel? Or do I just get as angry as I always got before? Do I, do I st am I still doing the same things? Or am I still attracting the same events as I was attracting a year ago? 
Has my life substantially changed in a positive direction over that time? Is the question I need to ask myself. Because if your life is substantially changed, then it usually indicates that you've received some love that's transformed your soul over that period. But if your life is substantially the same life as you had a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, if it's substantially the same, then I suggest that very little of God's love has been received. And what do we have to do then? If we want to receive it, we might need to work out what we're doing to block it, what we're doing to shut down the process of receiving God's love. Because remember, it's God's love that will change your soul. So it's only God's love that will help you get from that dimension to that dimension from a soul condition change. And what you attract will tell you whether that change has been made. Right? So like before I met Mary, I lived for five years alone. And I was making change here and making change there and making change here and different things in my life were changing, but I still didn't meet Mary. And so I had to look at, I, mind you, I had lots of offers of relationships in that time, right? which I refused because I knew that they all weren't my girl. Now, if I had engaged those offers of relationships, I'd probably still not have met Mary. Because by, by, by not engaging those relationships, I worked through a different emotions. And my soul, I received more of God's love and my soul condition changed and my attractions changed. So initially I attracted very angry, bitter women who used to always try to control me and, and all, all those kind of things. And eventually I started attracting women who were much softer than that, who, who were less demanding and controlling. And then as I dealt with more of my own grief, eventually I got to the point where my soul drew Mary into my life. Right? So, so if you've been alone for five years and your soulmate's still not near your life and you know that and you still haven't got a relationship happening and you've been trying to grow for five years, then my suggestion is there's got to be something blocking, blocking the flow of God's love that's causing you to be shut down in that regard. Because what you attract during this period of time will demonstrate to you that can change in your condition. This is where I feel a lot of people are not honest with themselves, Right? And, and to be frank, a lot of people in religions worldwide are not honest with themselves. Because the reality is you look back over 30 years of their life and they are usually just the same as they were 30 years ago. The same attitudes, the same belief systems, the same... Like, this is an indication. If you're the same as you were 30 years ago or 20 years ago, aside from the wrinkles changing, um, my suggestion is you're not growing in reception of God's love. Because if you were growing in the reception of God's love... There will always be change in your life. Change will be one of the constants, in fact, in your life. And the people who embrace the reception of God's love more generally are those who are willing to allow that change to occur. So most of us are terrified of change. If you're terrified of change, you might as well get off the divine love path and go and find another path that lets you be the same person for the next hundred years. Right? Because God wants you to continuously grow. Like to me that is pretty obvious. Like God creates a child, its mum gives birth, and the child doesn't stay a baby for the rest of its life. It grows. And to me that indicates that God wants us to continually grow, continually change. Right? And we have the potential to continually grow and change. But we stop. On earth we stop growing physically, but we also stop growing emotionally and spiritually. We stop growing in our condition of love. We, we accept the status quo of the people around us. We accept where everyone else is around us and we go, well, that's the average person and that's what I am, the average person or whatever. But if we're really progressing towards God, we're not going to be satisfied with that. We will want to continuously grow. So... Be honest with yourselves and go, okay, what was I like five years ago before I heard about divine truth and before I heard about receiving God's love? And what am I like right now, today? 
has that changed? Has my life changed over that period of time? Have I significantly changed? Has my attractions changed? Have I drew, drawn different people into my life over that period of time? Are the people in my life more loving over that period of time? Or are they less loving? What, 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 have, what has changed in my life? Have I, do I feel different now? Am I more aware now? Do I understand how I th- do I understand myself better than I did then? Because all of those things are the result of receiving God's love. There will be significant changes. And in fact, if you receive God's love, there will be significant changes in months, not years, generally. And there can be significant changes in days. It's just how much we can cope with the change, personally psychologically how much we can cope with it and for most of us we can't cope with much at all so we shut down the process of receiving God's love and so we don't change much and we will always if we receive more love we'll always be growing in love in the way that we reflect love to other people the way we act internally our ethical relationships with the universe around us so ethical relationships with men with women with animals, with children, with any living thing, in fact, the way that we view life will change significantly as we receive God's love. So that's how we measure whether it's working or not. If, if, it's not cha- if there's no change, then it means we have not grown and it means that whatever things we think we've done, we obviously haven't done. Right? For change to actually occur... The soul has to change. And God's love entering the soul is what changes the soul. So more love needs to enter your soul in order for you to change. So if there has been little change in five years, then it means you've received little love in five years. That's what it means. And the only reason why that would occur is either you don't have a sincere desire to receive that love or you've got a whole heap of things blocking it, pushing it away, you know, where you don't want it. Now that might be issues of lack of humility or a lack of desire for new truth or using your will out of harmony with the love you've already received or having no faith that you can grow. Now these are all parts of, of developing those things. But, but in the, at the end of the day, if you analyse your life today and you analyse your life a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, if there is not significant change, then it means you have not received love from God. And then it's up to you to determine why that's the case. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that help with your answer? Yep. Okay. Let's go straight. Uh, back to Scott, is it? Uh, no, let's come. Yeah, Scott first and then Dan. Yep. Hi, AJ. How are you doing? Um, I've got a question about God's laws that govern incarnation. And I'm come against this block, I don't understand how uh, having souls attached to their first physical body is allowed when the planet comes down to the hells like we are here on earth. Sorry, I don't understand the question, Scott, because souls aren't attached to their first physical bodies. I'm not in my first physical body now. Oh, you mean in the first incarnation? Yeah. Right? So the question is about not reincarnation, but incarnation. The, yes, the incarnation laws. Gotcha. Yeah. And so what was the question again? So, how, how is it loving for all of us to have come to a planet that's descended to the hells? Okay. Good question. And, but... The question really is driven by this idea or concept that perhaps God hasn't been loving. Whereas what I would do is I'd I'd make the assumption that perhaps humans haven't been loving first. (laughs) Does that make sense? Let's look at what God created originally. What God created originally was two, like a perfect human habitation that didn't, uh, earth, that did not have people on it. Right? It had in a complete environment where there was enough food, the appropriate systems in terms of weather and all these other systems, 
the appropriate food production systems and everything were all present before mankind came into existence. The very first human couple that came into existence, if you talk to them, they were Ammon and Amman, the people that the Bible refers to as Adam and Eve, right? The male I am, the female I am. Now, when they arrived on earth, they arrived in a perfect physical condition. They had no physical ailments, no physical sickness. Even though diseases did exist on the planet, right, and bacteria existed on the planet and so forth, they had the ability to basically prevent any of those things from harming themselves through their condition. They also had the, at this potential point of time, they had the potential to receive God's love. And I say the potential because they did not choose to engage that potential. But they had the potential. God offered them the potential of receiving God's love. And they knew it. They knew it was available to them, actually. And when you talk to them... They realised that they know God, knew God's love was available and they also knew their condition was perfect. And if you talk to them now, they think that our condition on earth now is terrible. They think most of us are very ugly in comparison to what they were at the time. Uh, oftentimes we're out of proportion in a lot of ways. Um, even down to you know how our left and right sides are all out of proportion generally. They're not, well, they had perfect physical symmetry um, so that they and they understood how much of the things in the earth around them worked through experience but they had a very developed intellect they used a hundred percent of their brain so we use what how much of our brain scientists say ten percent and there's now estimates that it might even be just as low as two percent of our brain and um, so so yeah, how about that? Like, and, but they used 100% of their brain. So they had the ability to reason logically and uh, with, with clarity uh, much more than we did at the time. Now, the problem that it was is they became so enamoured with their own condition that they believed that they did not need God's love in order to grow. So a belief inside of them began developing through the condition of arrogance. You see, each of these qualities have to be developed, even if we're in a perfect condition. So God started us off in a perfect condition, the human race, and each of these qualities still have to be developed. They chose to not develop some of these qualities through their choice. As a result of their choice, their condition degraded. <clears throat> As their condition degraded, so too did the condition of their progeny. Now, who is to blame for that occurring? Is God to blame for them making their choice? No. So God gave them the gift of free will. So you could say the only way God is to blame for them making this choice is that God gave them the gift of free will and that enabled them to make this choice. If God had never given them the gift of free will, then they wouldn't have been able to make that choice. But then they wouldn't be what we are. They wouldn't be human. They wouldn't be the highest of God's creation. They'd be like an animal because animals don't have the same kind of choices that we have. So, the only way that God is responsible for mankind making the choice is by giving God, them a gift of free will. And you could say, in a way, that's like me giving you a knife to cut up your veggies. If you go out and stab somebody with that knife, am I responsible for the gift of the knife? If you have free will, surely it's your responsibility how you use that will. Now, the result of that, the use of will out of harmony with love, has ended up with the world we currently have. It's not what God wants us to do. 
but God honors the fact that we're allowed to choose it. And the fact that new souls, when they incarnate, are a part of that system is unavoidable from God's perspective. Do you understand? And the reason why it's unavoidable is because man made the choice. We could make a different choice. So you and I can make a different choice, but also collectively we can make a different choice. For example, worldwide we could make a choice to never go to war again for any reason and be willing to die for that choice. In other words, be willing, my willingness to not go to war means that somebody else might come and kill me and I'd be okay with that. I could make that choice. Now, if I made that choice, can you see eventually, if everyone made that choice, we would have a different world, wouldn't we? But it requires everyone making the choice. And the only reason why we have the world that we currently have is because everyone has chosen to make a different choice. A choice to not love. That's the only reason why we have the world we currently have. Now, the problem for us is this. Collectively and also historically, mankind has made the choice to not love. And even right now, many of us in our day-to-day -day lives are still making the choice to not love. And many times we're not even aware of these choices, but a lot of times we are aware. We know we're making a choice to not love, and yet we still choose it. What we've got to learn to do is to use our will to make a different choice. And in fact, the main reason why Mary and I and others of the 14 came back to earth is to illustrate to mankind the results of making a different choice. Does that make sense? The main reason why we returned was not... We want to show what it's like to make a choice of love in an unloving world. See, a lot of people on earth today believe that it's not possible to make a loving choice in an unloving world. But it is. It is possible. You've just got to have courage right, to make a different choice. Now, if we make a different choice, we will have an earth that's very, very different. And in future generations, if all of us make a different choice, we can get to the point where not a single child who incarnates onto this planet has any illness, any disease, any problems emotionally, physically, spiritually or otherwise. Just from our choice. But if we don't have some form of feedback system about our choices, we will make choices that are unloving without any consequence. And we've got to see that the consequences of what we've created now are the results of the previous generation's choices to be unloving. And we've got to see the relationship. So incarnation at the moment is painful. It's a painful process, emotionally painful process. But only because we, humanity collectively, has made the wrong choice. The choice to not be loving. That's the choice we've made. And many of us individually are still making that choice to not be loving. We're still doing it. Right? And, and we make all sorts of excuses to do it. So, for example, we go to war. Your country gone to war. Many occasions in the last like 20 years, that's a choice that's collectively driven by all of the people in the country. Right? And a lot of times it's driven by the emotions of the people in the country, of fear. Fear that you won't have enough. Fear that your life as you know it will change. Fear, all sorts of fears come up and that causes us to make choices that are unloving. We can choose differently, but we're going to have to have courage to choose differently. So the reason why incarnation is, is at the moment, a very painful process is because prior to us and this current generation of people have all made unloving choices. And that's the only reason why 
incarnation is in the state it currently is at the moment. It could be different, but it's going to involve us seeing the results of the choices we have collectively made and collectively deciding to change those choices. It also requires that we individually change, desire to change even when others don't want to. See, the majority of us don't want to do that. What we want is for everybody to change and then I'll change. And what I'm suggesting to you is you change and show everybody how to change. Show everybody that you can love in an unloving world. You can use your will in harmony with love every single time. Show people through your example that you can do that. That, it, that will be the start of the change. So you know how there's all these spiritual movements at the moment saying, oh, we're going to have this wonderful world in the future. and you, None of them have any real clear idea of how it's going to happen, right? They think that some people are going to come from outer space to do it or, you know, there's all sorts of theories of how it's going to occur. The way it's going to occur is by, by there being leaders of change who decide to use their will in harmony with God's love. That's how it's going to happen. And how long it takes will depend on how many people do that. But just one person doing it can change the world. In the first century, I chose to do that in an unloving world. And I was in my first incarnation, just like many of you are. So I chose to do it in an unloving world. I didn't make the excuse, oh, but it's all too hard because I've, all, I've come to an unloving world. I decided to have that relationship with God, desire to grow, change and become more loving, use my will to do so in an unloving world. And that's what I'm recommending for you to do, the same thing as that. When you do that, you will understand the reasons the real reasons why incarnation is so difficult today. You, because you, as you receive God's love, you start seeing the whole picture as to why it's turned out to be see, what it is now, seemingly quite bad. But it's actually the result of our historical and current unloving choices. So there's hardly a single person of us in this room that could say that we have changed all of the unloving choices of our own parents through our own actions. Right. But that's what is going to be required of us if we, require, if we want the next generation of people who incarnate, the next generation of children to have an easier life, we are going to need to change. And if, we, if we're not prepared to do it for our own sake, in other words, we don't have enough love of ourselves to do it for ourselves, surely our love for others would ask us to do it. And particularly our love for our own children would ask us to do it. And if we can't do it for the sake of our own children, I doubt whether we're going to do it for any reason. And that's been the problem historically. The parents became selfish they chose to do a certain course of action out of harmony with God's love, but in harmony with their own will. That damaged the next generation of children. They saw the damage and yet did not correct its cause. They continued the process of damage. And then the next generation did the same, the next generation did the same, because the reality is we don't care as much about our children as we believe we do. You know, in the average Western country, we slaughter a lot of them before they're even born. That's how little we really care about them. Right? We abort them before they're even born. And, and the, re the reality is we beat them. You know, when they're little, we're violent towards them. We demonstrate our own condition to our own children and then hope that the next generation of people will have an easier life when they incarnate. It's not possible. 
We need to see what we create. And this is why God has made us personally responsible for what we create. So what we see on earth now is the direct result of God making us personally responsible for what we, humanity, has created. Does that make sense? And when we incarnate, if our parents really loved us, they would not have chosen to impose their own emotional burdens and unloving condition on us they would have made the choice to change. But they didn't. And so we're left with what we have. But we can make the choice to change. Does that help? Not really. No, it didn't. No? I've heard you say that before. Um, and so what's the emotional problem you have with that? Well, I, I feel like my soul and every other soul that's come since earth descended into the hells yeah. has been a sacrifice for all the people that are already here or came before us. What? In what way do you feel they're a sacrifice? No, that, that I'm a sacrifice. You're the that, sacrifice? In what way do you feel you're the sacrifice? That I didn't have a, a choice to come here and I wasn't given like an equal opportunity that a man and a man had. So I don't feel like I was treated equally. You do have an equal opportunity to what a man and a man had. The opportunity, but not the environment. I mean, I, pe people are infertile now. I mean, lots of people are infertile. So why don't the laws make people infertile once we drop into the hells? Well, if that happened, the whole of humanity would have died within probably six to ten generations. And God would have had to create a whole new set of humanity after that. Well, there could be a lot of volunteers from the celestial kingdoms instead of... No, because putting... there was no one in the celestial kingdom at that point. <laughs> See, it's like there are always problems generally with the way we reason when we have certain emotions that are driving our feelings. So there's an emo what I'm trying to get at with yourself is there's an emotion you feel about this of unfairness and you feel this with God so can I make a suggestion to you about this get angry with God about it right allow yourself to feel the emotion you feel about it right see at the moment you're shutting down the emotion you feel about it looking for another intellectual explanation than, one's already, than one that's already been given you do not feel the explanation given is fair. Feel that. Because when you go through the feelings of that, you will actually release the emotion that blocks you to understanding. Does that make sense? And until you release the emotion that blocks you to understanding, no amount of explanation on my part will satisfy you. Well, I was hopeful because your explanation of faith broke through for me. Yeah. So at this stage, you don't necessarily have complete faith that God is good. You also, at this stage, do not understand the level of self-responsibility God has given you. And not only you, but every single person who's ever lived. And, and once you go through some of these emotions that you feel you will understand that. You will feel the level of self-responsibility and then you'll understand better why God created it the way God created it. Does that make sense? At the moment, no amount of explanation on my part will help you overcome that because there's an emotion in you that blocks you to feeling the level of self-responsibility that you have for your own life. And the reason why... Most of the time, people who ask me this question, I've been asked that question hundreds of times, as you can imagine. Most of the time, people who ask me this question want somebody else to be responsible for their current condition, for having to feel about their current condition. Does that make sense? Now, the reality is that God's love will transform your current condition if you're open to receiving it. But at the moment, you're blocked to receiving it because you still feel the blame of God about what God created rather than just going through the emotion. 
And while that is felt within you, there will be a block to receiving. And when there's a block to receiving, God's love can't transform. And if God's love can't transform, then you're going to have a difficulty understanding. Does that make sense? Is it, it's all like a, what do you call it, a, a snowball effect on each other. They're all linked to each other. So this is the explanation of what happened. You feel that's unfair, so feel about that. Because that is one of the blockages to receiving love from God inside of you. You're hoping for a different explanation. One that you believe is more loving. But the trouble with some of your explanations is that uh, they would have all sorts of other problems associated with them. Does that make sense? There's all, all sorts of other illogical things that will be raised trying to find another explanation as than the one that really happened. When you talk to this couple, um, you learn what really happened. And then you'll have feelings about what really happened. Let yourself feel the feelings about what happened. Let yourself feel your anger with them <laughs> and their current and their children. Let yourself feel some of the feelings that you have about you know, your parents not making the choice to love and therefore you arriving in a better condition. Let yourself feel about those particular things. Once you feel about them, you will understand quite a lot of things, including the temporary nature of our life on earth in comparison with our internal future. Is there no point that the race will become infertile ever? I don't believe so. Um, infertility is caused by certain emotional conditions. And it's highly unlikely that every single person on the planet would have the same emotional condition with regard to infertility. Yeah. So it, it's highly unlikely that we'll become infertile and then die, sorry, die off as a result. But it's, um, it's an interesting theory you have. Write down all of the things as to why you want that to happen. <laughs> and then... Feel about what would be the results from God's perspective. Does that make sense? So while it may appear to be a solution to you at the moment, and it may appear to be that God should have done that, <laughs> the reality is there are quite a number of very significant and uh, things that would have occurred as a result of that particular condition being reached. Yeah. Because the reality is, the human, if that had happened, the human race would have died off many tens of thousands of years ago. And uh, you wouldn't have had the opportunity to come here at all under those circumstances. Well, it's a pretty big universe. <laughs> True, but, but the way God's created the incarnation process is that certain souls incarnate to, one, to a certain location. You, you your soul could not have in its first incarnation incarnated to another planet that had human life. It could only incarnate to this one. At some point in your future, you'll see the reasons why that occurred. Right? But that, that is a physical limitation of incarnation presently. And as a result of that, if, the, if humanity died off, then your potential incarnation could only have occurred by God creating another human couple. And then what's to say that that human couple wouldn't have made the same decision that these made? It's possible they would have made the same decision. And then they would have all died off, and then God would be forever creating new human couples to get it started, when I feel the way God's done it is, is much more economical. <laughs> But allow yourself, it's the emotion inside of you of unfairness that, that is really being triggered here. Let yourself feel it. Let yourself feel it with God. Yeah. Then things will have more clarity. Thank you. Yeah. Let's uh, say we have a break. It must be two or three hours in already, is it? Yeah. What is the time? Quarter to four.